It's great to see you here this morning, and uh, especially on this 4th of July holiday. Uh, God's got some good things to share, and I think He wants to speak to all of us from, uh, from His Word. So, you know, I want to start, you know, if you've lived here any length of time, you're familiar with uh, Oak Ridge. We live out in West Knoxville, and that's not too far from us. Oak Ridge, Tennessee is really known all over the world for the part it played in uh, the victory over Japan in World War II. And a few years ago, I was able to go out to a little museum they have there in uh, in Oak Ridge called the American Museum of Science and Energy. If you haven't ever gone, it's an interesting place. And they have this little section there that's devoted to how Oak Ridge was transformed from this little backwoods rural community to what it became in its uh, production of the the materials for the, the atomic bomb. And so it's very famous. And uh, if you go in that little place that, uh, that talks about it, there's a letter that's framed there, and I don't know if it's still there, but I do remember this. The letter was written to all the people that lived in that sleepy little town that was uh, rural and, and backwoods uh, with this uh, notice that they would have received in 19 and, uh, 1942, all the property owners. It said, The War Department intends to take possession of your farm December 1st, 1942. That had only been written like three weeks before uh, that date. So, and it goes on. It says, it will be necessary for you to move. Yay. Not later than that date. Pretty amazing, huh? You know, one of those farms was uh, owned by uh, by a man that's in that display too, by the name of John Hendricks. I don't know if you've heard his story. It's pretty interesting. But as the story goes, John Hendricks' uh, daughter had died back in 1900. And because of all the pain and all the, the difficulty with that, his wife had sort of blamed John and had taken their whole, all his daughters and, and moved to Arkansas. And it left John Hendricks uh, really a broken man. And uh, he wandered in the woods, the story goes, into the woods and spent more than a month living alone after that time, praying for hours, sleeping there on the ground. And if it hadn't been for a, a local lady, they say, who gave him chicken soup at night and brought him a quilt to keep him warm, uh, he would have uh, probably died. But when Hendrix came back from that experience after a month uh, of, of sort of living in self-imposed isolation, he, uh, he told everyone that during his time alone, he had had a vision. And uh, according to accounts, Hendricks said something along these lines. Bear Creek Valley, which is now part of Oak Ridge, someday will be filled with great buildings and factories. This is back in 1900. And they will help toward winning the greatest war that will ever be. Big engines and build, uh, build big ditches. Big engines will build, build big ditches, and thousands of people will be running to and fro. They will be building things, and there will be great noise and confusion, and the earth will shake. I've seen it. It's coming, he said. And of course, we know that the end of that, or really the accuracy of how that planned out, right? It was a pretty accurate little prophetic word or a prediction. What an amazing one. You know, you think about that. Uh, just astounding, and, and uh, how it, its resolution was even given. Well, today we're going to look at an even more astounding prophecy out of the book of, a da- of Daniel. We've been looking in the series Daniel, we're going to look at it, and this prophecy is far more amazing and actually more accurate than you could ever imagine. Daniel chapter 11, and it answers this question, how do you respond to evil when it goes from bad to worse? And I think we're living in a day like that. We're watching all the stuff that goes on around us. How do you respond when you see all the stuff that's going on that's not good? And someone once said, if you stand for something, you'll have people for you and people against you. But if you stand for nothing, you will have nobody for you and nobody against you. And I have to be honest and say this because I think that's a really, uh, it's a great deal of where the church is today. Standing for nothing, sitting for everything. At least, I would say, in, in our current woke and, and twisted culture, that's the norm, even in our churches. For example, I was listening to Dr. Alveda King this past week, 
who was pushing back against this uh, distorted idea of what's known as critical race theory. If you don't know what that is, you need to find out because it's affecting every, seem like every place, every institution, every position that you can ever think of, and it affects us. And here's the late, and I don't think there's probably anybody who's, who's probably more capable of speaking to this issue than the, the late Dr. Martin Luther King's niece. I mean, she's in it, right? And uh, she's the, 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 her dad, the, the civil rights champion, or her uh, uncle, or civil, the civil rights champion. She said this about critical race theory. She said, it's a lie. It's not true. And she's, of course, if you've ever listened to, the, to Dr. Alveda King, she's, she does it with such grace. She's a Christian. She says it's a lie. It's not true. It was Darwin who promoted the idea that there is a critical race and that, once, that one race is, is more superior than the others and everybody is not the same. But here's what the Bible says. Acts 17, 26. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. She goes on. Critical race theory ends up in godless laws that seek to divide people and turn that truth into a lie. Now here's what I want you to get this morning. And it's, it's uh, up on the screen. When, we, when faced with the problem of increasing evil in our world, we must be unafraid to speak and live as champions of righteousness. Amen. We need that today, folks. We need to, to be that way, just like Dr. Alveda King's great example. See, the gospel calls us to imitate Jesus and be lovers of what is good. That's what it says in Titus 1.8. And my question is, do we love goodness and righteousness enough to do something to keep it? We're celebrating Independence Day. You can't have Independence Day unless it costs somebody something. Freedom is not free. To lose our freedoms because we're silent in either our prayers to God or even to speak into this culture, boy, that would be a tragedy. But it's, I think it's starting to happen because the church has been sitting Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its savor, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Well, let's, let's get into God's Word and let's pray before we do. I believe God has something for us this morning. Father, we're just praying that You, by Your Spirit, would open our minds and our ears and our hearts and honor your word, Lord, let it, let it uh, go deep within us and uh, cause us to increase our faith. Build our faith, we ask it, and give us clarity today. Transformation in Jesus' name. Well, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to share with you the meaning of this final uh, vision of Daniel. I can't say it was without a lot of blood, blood sweat, and tears. <laughs> this, was a, this was a hard one because... This prophecy is really complex. It's hard to, in fact, it's all over the map in terms of interpretation go. You look at that, all the commentaries, and it's like, okay, nobody seems to know what they're talking about. Uh, and, and by the way, I was so encouraged by one commentator who said, this might be good for a Bible class lecture, but we do not see how it could be used for a sermon or for sermons. <laughs> That's like, great. Okay. So help me, Lord. That's kind of what I pray. Well, for, uh, just for the sake of some, some hooks to put your uh, thoughts on, I'm going to just kind of give this to you under four ideas this morning and try to summarize because it's long. And, uh, and I'll just give it to you as we go through it. The first one is uh, what I say is the context for the vision. The context for the vision. The vision being chapters 10 through 12 is a singular unit. So the vision is all the way, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. That's Daniel's fourth and final vision. And what we see in chapter 10, we need to go there to see what the vision is about. Let's look at it in verse uh, 1 of chapter 10. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel whose name was named Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. 
So here we see God's final revelation to Daniel is about a great war that will take place. Notice the vision here, it says, was in the third year of King Cyrus. Now, if you, if you remember, in the first year, what had happened? In that first year of King Cyrus, he'd been called by God to uh, really command the people of Israel to leave Babylon and to go back to Jerusalem, the city of God, and rebuild the temple. And uh, as the history goes, the, probably only about 40 people, 40,000 people went. But uh, you can read all about that in Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It's a fascinating account of how God speaks to a pagan king to tell him something that benefits the people of God. So, uh, soon after the, the, the people started going back to Jerusalem from the Babylonian exile, the ones that went, they started these, these construction projects began, and the builders got in sight, the construction crews, they arrived, and they began to work, and, and just almost immediately they began to get this opposition to the work. And it says they became fearful, they became discouraged, and ultimately they, they, they just laid their tools down. And quit because it was so fierce. Ezra chapter 4 verse 5 tells us that this opposition continued, listen, all the days of Cyrus king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius king of Persia. A little nugget there that you might not know unless you read, read that book. This was a long time where nothing was going on. Everything was just kind of stopped. Well, you know, Daniel was aware of all this. And uh, you see him mourning the fact that what he thought was going to happen wasn't happening. If you put yourself in his shoes, Daniel, who had been aware that he was going to be there for 70 years, and that's what he found in the Scriptures, well, 70 years is up. The people are back in the land, but now it's stopped again. And so you think of this old man who spent 70 years waiting for something to happen, and now it's not happening again. Can you imagine how discouraged he might have felt? So he's given insight as to why, and we see his prayers in chapter 9 uh, are really about that. He's praying to God, almost like going, Lord, what is it? what's going on? Why is this happening? And he'd been hindered, the angel tells him in this previous chapter, he'd been hindered by a spiritual conflict. In fact, this spiritual conflict is the context for this whole vision. Chapters 9, chapters 10, chapter 11. So now we see the angel revealed to Daniel in that regard from chapter 10, verse 20, on into where we are today, chapter 11, verse 1. Follow along with me there in 1020. He said, then he said, do you know why I have come to you? This is the angel speaking. But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except these, except against these, except Michael, your prince. Now, I don't know, I can't prove this, but you think if God was setting up the, 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 the angels to fight against this opposition that was occurring, that he would handle his own folks up there, right? I think, I think that this angel is saying, I don't have any human people to contend by my side while I'm fighting. Everybody's just sat down. And I'm fighting this fight by myself. Chapter 11 begins with these words, And as for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. The angel is saying, I stood up to help this human king Turn things around. Did you know that the rebuilding of the temple that had been stopped in the reign of Cyrus, guess what happened under the reign of Darius? They began to rebuild again. And you say, how did that happen? Well, it was the result of successful angelic warfare in the heavenly realm. So this angel is sort of like, Daniel, I know you've been praying. I know, I understand. In fact, you got to understand, there's things going on that you don't even see. But I heard your prayers. 
from the very first day you began to pray, I heard your prayers, but I've been in a fight. There's more here than meets the eye. So Daniel is enlightened about this unseen war that so very practically affects what goes on down here. And hopefully we are too. And uh, we're in light. This, this war that's sort of behind the scenes of history, this invisible war that goes on behind the evil that we see all around us, there is this unseen conflict that, that's occurring even in your life and mine. If we follow Christ, there, the, the conflict between the forces of good and evil, the light and darkness. And so it plays out. How does it play out? As a battle over ideas, mindsets, philosophies, beliefs, values, laws, which often result in evil practices. Satan's world system is constantly at work, as as the Bible says, to squeeze us into its mold. And we're drawn in to embrace the lies that the enemy is trying to, to push out there. If that perspective sounds really strange to you, this is the worldview of the New Testament, folks. And we have to get on that understanding that Daniel came to himself, that the angel gave him. What happened in the first year of Darius that would cause this angel to fight to protect the people of God? Well, that was the year, chapter 9, verse 1, that was the year that Daniel began to pray. Do you think it's any accident that, that those markers of time were put in there? It's, it's so that we can understand, and the angel communicates, what you're doing in the heavenlies through your prayers is having a tremendous effect. So God, God wants us to engage in this battle through prayer. This is what, the Paul, what Paul pointed to when he, when he said in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And our question is, do you believe that? Church, do we believe that? So like Dan, we should make prayer a priority in order to what? To advance God's agenda. And, and, and this is the reason we're called to pray for kings, as it says, 1 Timothy 2, pray for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. How does that happen? How does, a, how does a nation not fall apart through evil activities? Well, it's because people who were called the people of God are doing something about it. Thomas Monson once wrote, he said, The philosophies of men surround us. The face of sin today often wears the mask of tolerance. Do not be deceived because behind that facade is heartache, unhappiness, and pain. You know what is right and what is wrong, and no disguise, however appealing, can change that. Be the one to make a stand for right, even if you stand alone. Have the moral courage to be a light for others to follow. And that really just sets the stage for chapter 11 and the vision itself. And we move on to the second point. That's the context. Now let's look at the truth about history. And he says in chapter 11, verse 2, and now, the angel says, now I will show you the truth. In other words, let me tell you what's really going on here, Daniel, that you don't see. And, And I'll just say a few things about this prophecy. The prophecy itself is amazingly accurate, especially from verses 2 through 35. So accurate, in fact, that the secular scholars, they don't have an answer for how all the details of the prophecy are so right on target. So they make up a theory saying that, well, it's, it's history after the fact, uh, prophecy after the fact. And so their perspective is, well, someone ba- later, much later than Daniel's time in 167, looked back on all this history and they wrote it all down and put Daniel's name on it. <laughs> <laughs> which is not history at all. I mean, it, here's the thing. If you, if you can't believe that Daniel was spoken to by the God of heaven and, and all the things we've read up until this time, if God is not able, if, or if he is able to do that, why in the world could he not tell Daniel the details in this prophecy? And of course we know God can do anything he wants to. So it's an amazingly accurate prophecy. 
Uh, it's also one of the longest and most complex prophecies in the Bible. John Calvin, I was looking at this, John Calvin in his own commentary took over a hundred pages to cover all this stuff, to explain it. Every line has, has something new. And I was reading through it, I was like, wow. In fact, the first 35 verses of this chapter contain 135 prophetic statements, all now fulfilled for us. And they set the stage for, for events that are yet future. So if you all will just kind of get comfortable, sit back, settle down in your seat, we're going to go through each one of these for the next, and for the next two hours. I'm, I'm kidding. Not really. Happy, happy Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, it will help to keep in mind, I think, as we go through this, uh, this chapter kind of continues a theme of the book. If you remember the theme of the book is basically uh, fallen human governments are opposed to God. Just a simple fact. Fallen human governments are opposed to God. It doesn't take a, a lot of effort to see that. Each empire that's mentioned in these verses becomes more and more anti-God and all the way through the Bible all the way through history even, to the end of time. So, in summary, let me just kind of give you a little summary of all this here. It's, uh, it's set for us. There are five prophetic eras referred to here. Persia, Greece, Egypt, and Syria, which is a singular. Persia, Greece, e Egypt, and Syria. Antiochus the Fourth, Epiphanes. And then finally, the king who exalts himself. So very quickly, let's look at this. Daniel's vision of history begins with events of the future. And that's in verses 2 through 20. Events of the future, at least to Daniel. They're past for us. The future of the Persian Empire is summarized in verse 2. And these are, these are wealthy Persian kings. He says in the prophecy, Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. These, the three kings, and we know who they are, Cyrus after, after Cyrus, Cambyses, Smyrtus, and Darius. The fourth king we know through history is Xerxes I, also known as Ahasuerus. And this is the king. Ahasuerus was the king who uh, selected the Jewish orphan, you know her name, Esther, as the queen of Persia. He was known to be super rich, just as the text says. And then you have another interval in what's recorded here, maybe 150 to 200 years later. Uh, we see in verses 3 through 4, the mighty king of Greece. Look at the text, verse 3, And when he, that is the fourth Persian king, has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he is risen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. And so from the previous de visions, Daniel knows who exactly, uh, who all these people are, this sequence of these great empires. In verse 3, again, we see here described a mighty king. Who's that mighty king? We talked about him in chapter 8. His name was Alexander the Great. Historical figure, Alexander the Great, and despite, if you know Alexander, his history, despite his dominating military conquest, his kingdom was indeed broken. And if you remember, that was what we talked about, the billy goat on steroids back in chapter 8. That was Alexander, and his horn was broken off. Alexander, died, Alexander the Great died at the age of 32, and none of what he obtained, he got to pass on to his heirs. His kingdom was, as it said, divided to the four winds of heaven. As we kind of say it like this. You know, when you say somebody said they, uh, they, scattered, they were scattered to the four winds, it's kind of that idea. All point to the compass. But specifically here, these kings can also be accurately identified in history. And these are a little more important. Cassander took Macedonia. Lysimachus took Thrace, the area called Thrace in Asia Minor. Ptolemy took Egypt, and Seleucus took Syria. Now, if you're a history buff, you may remember and know about those. But at this point in the prophecy, it focuses on the, just these last two empires. The one called the Seleucids, which is to the north, that's Syria, and the Ptolemies, the Ptolemaic kings to the south, 
which represent Egypt. Then you say, well, to the north and south of what? Well, right in the middle of all these wars is guess who? The people of God, the promised land, Israel. They're caught in between the rock, a rock and a hard place. All these wars are going on. And uh, verse 16 even calls it the glorious land, a place of God's covenant people. So let's go on. Verses 5 through 20 then describe these manipulative, what we call kings of the north and the south. And I say, if you're a history buff, you might want to know all those details. I can give you some references after. If you want to come up, I can give you a couple of good resources. But to save us time and kind of keep your brain from fogging over and uh, having your eyes glaze over, I'm just kind of going to give you, we're not going to go all through this. We don't have time. But I'll just give you the essence of it. Because we move now from events of the near future in verses 2 through 20 to events of the distant future. Verses 21 through 35. To th- through 35. From here, uh, this really brings us up to, to uh, about 167 B.C. And the rise of what I call a megalomaniac king. Uh, look at verse 21. It says, In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. You say, well, why contemptible? Because here's a person who has such an exaggerated uh, feeling of his own, own importance, his excessive craving for uh, attention and admiration, and he cares only about himself. And uh, you remember, we talked about him in chapter 8. His name was Antiochus IV. And those who knew him or were influenced by his evil policies, they came up with that nickname. He wanted to call himself uh, Antiochus Antiochus Epimenes, which means the glorious one, the glorious God. But everybody else called him Antiochus Epiphanes, the crazy man, <laughs> the madman. That was his nickname. So he's doing all this stuff. And eventually, Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a horrible, horrible guy. You might consider people in history like, um, I don't know, uh, Hitler or Mussolini or, or maybe even the, the people, uh, the person over North Korea even now or over Iran. This is the kind of person that we're talking about. And uh, so eventually he stopped by Rome. The Romans have had enough of this guy because he is indeed contemptible. And they they want to stop him him from his expansionist dreams that he's trying to to take over everything. But guess what? He's not a gracious loser. Um, I wish I had time to tell you. Well, I'll tell you this story because it's interesting. Because the Romans met him one day on a beach and the Roman general stopped him and they, they confronted him with his with his army, and right there on the beach, the Roman general, he uh, in the stand, he takes a little stick and he draws a circle around Antiochus. And he said, if you step outside this circle, I'll take it that you don't want to stop what you're doing. But if you decide to do what I tell you and submit and go back home, we'll let you live. And of course, Antiochus stayed right in the circle and he, he goes back home. He says... And in verse 31, he takes it out on the Jews at Jerusalem. For, for he says in 31, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress. He's not a good loser. He goes back and, and it says, and he shall take away the regular burnt offering. And they shall set up, here's a familiar phrase, the abomination that makes desolate. And so what does he want to do? He wants to take Jerusalem and make it the city of God. He wants to make it Greek. So he outlaws, what does he do? He outlaws the Jewish religion. He changes the temple worship. And in the process, he murders thousands and thousands of Jews. And so that's the abomination of desolation because what do the Jews do? They scram. (laughs) The, The temple becomes basically a parking lot, like a vacant lot. And nobody is there because of him. And so what does he do? He comes in, he puts a statue of Zeus on the, on the altar. And that is called the abomination of desolation. Question. What should God's people do in response to a cultural war like that? Answer. You conduct warfare on a whole different level via wisdom. Listen to verse 32. 
He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, which is basically not much help. And many shall join themselves to them with flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. I'm going to stop right here, and let's just say, okay, we've gone through a, a good portion of this history. You think, what's the point of this? And it took me a while just to look through and say, I think there's four essential truths, and I, I, I give some credit to Sinclair Ferguson for some of these thoughts, just with some modification. But let me give them to you. There's four basic things, four truths that come out of these verses. Number one, Daniel's vision shows us the chronic instability of the kingdoms of the earth. And so the point of rehashing history here is not about history. It's prophetic history. It's God's perspective on history. And it shows us, shows us in Daniel too, that all human history is part of a fundamental conflict in which the object is the destruction of the city of God. See, so the analogy, the city of God was Jerusalem, but the city of God for us is what God is building in us, what God wants to do with His kingdom. The enemy always wants to destroy that. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy what's going on in you. And you know all the pushback that you get for just living life. There's also stuff going on you kind of can't even explain. Number two, evil cannot gain a foothold in the city of God unless God's people allow it. Look at verses 32 and 33 again. Oh, just this one little phrase. The people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. As I say, the, the enemy wants to, to destroy what God wants to build. It, it doesn't take a theologian with a PhD, folks, to kind of see that there's a fight going on between good and evil in our culture. If you don't see that, your head's been in the sand. I'll just be quite honest with you. And it's been that way in every culture throughout history for the people of God. They're right in the middle, remember? And we are right in the middle. It's not easy to know when and how to step into the battle, though, is it? It can be a fearful thing. You have to ask, what is it going to cost me? You know, if you've ever had a chance to, uh, to go to Pall Mall, Tennessee, you should go. You say, where in the world is Pall Mall, Tennessee? It's in North Middle North Tennessee, off the interstate, I don't know, 20 miles. How did you know about that? Well, there in Pall Mall, Tennessee, is a memorial to, a, to world, I guess, Tennessee's World War I military hero. And he's probably the most decorated military hero that the U.S. ever had for World War I. His name was Alvin York. I think I've talked about him before. But his story is really interesting because back when, uh, when the World War, World War I began, York was drafted into the U.S. Army. But there was a major problem for him because guess what? He was a pacifist. That's a problem if you're going to a war, right? In fact, he had written these words in uh, his draft registration card, don't want to fight. <laughs> just, just that, don't want to fight. Well, when he arrived at boot camp, the story goes... Um, he, uh, he, he, he shared that you know, with his, the unit that he was signed to the guy that was over, he said, you know, I'm a pacifist. I don't, I don't feel like it's right. And, and Alvin York, by this time, he was a Christian. He said, I do this based on my moral, on moral grounds because of what I believe. Just so happened that his, uh, his commanding officer was also a Christian. And so he told Alvin York, and this would not happen in our day, but he told him uh, all that... Uh, you know, they kind of argued back and forth. And he said, well, listen, Alvin. He said, if you take 10 days and you go pray and reflect on what we talked about here, he said, if you still believe like you have just shared with me, then I'll, I'll release you from service. 
you won't have to go fight. And so Alvin goes back to the hills of Tennessee, and then he went up on this mountain bluff. I've seen the bluff. Uh, It's still there near his home. And he, he fasted and prayed for three days. Asking God, God, what do I do? Do because I want to honor you. I believe the the Bible says, "Thou thou shalt not kill." And yet, I'm called to to defend my country for an, a righteous cause. So, after three days and nights, he comes down from the mountain with his answer. God has spoke to his heart clearly, and here's what he said: Some things are worth fighting for. Some things are worth fighting for. Another character you may know of, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, had the same decision to make in World War II. Here's what he said, Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Well, the third truth that we see here is this one. The aim of evil is always to destroy the people of God, but God is still in control. He won't allow evil to go beyond its limits. And and you know what? I was looking, as I was looking through these, where where is this concept? I know it's showing that God is always in control, but if you look at it, there's a a word there that that occurs a number of times throughout that passage, and it's the word but. It's used in verses 4, 6, 7, 9, 11, 12, 14, 18, 19, 20, 21, 25, 27, and 29. But what? But God. But God. And so if you look at each king who conspires and manipulates and strategizes to gain control and power to do his evil thing, yeah, God lets it happen for a little while, and then he shuts it down. He shuts it down. God always intervenes and shuts evil down. It may not look, and you may wonder, when is this going to end? God has not fallen off His throne, folks. He knows exactly what's happening in history. Number four, God has a purpose for His people in all the evil circumstances of their lives. That's in verse 35. You say, what's the point of this? It's funny because we think God, God, it just bad stuff happens. God is using even the bad stuff For good things, he says in verse 35, and some of the wise shall stumble. In other words, some people are really going to have a hard time with this and their faith is going to falter. So that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. See, the pushback we get to telling and living the gospel will also be the means by which God conforms us into the image of Christ. It's just part of it. That's, that's expected. If you're a Christian and you're not being persecuted, you need to put a question mark on what's going on with me. I have to ask that. And I've asked that at the times it's like, this is not good. I mean, I'm not going out looking for persecution. Nobody wants that. But if you're living the life, you're going to get pushed back. And in the purifying process, guess what? It will continue to the time of the end. That's the the time we're living in. It's the part of the vision from chapter 7 and 8 that's the Romans period. The Roman period, basically, all the way to the end. Now, at Daniel 11.36, there's a sharp transition. And the prophecy, it leaps the centuries into something not yet fulfilled. The kingship shifts from this guy Antiochus Epiphanes IV to the man he foreshadowed. He's sort of a he's a type of, of somebody else. Who is that? The Antichrist of verses thirty six through forty five. And I just call this the king. He's called I call him the King of Chaos. <laughs> the King of Chaos. You see chaos going all around you. Who's the author of chaos and confusion? The King of Chaos and the coming world religion. Let's look at these verses thirty six. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished. For what is decreed shall be done. You know, in the New Testament, Paul describes this 
Antichrist in a similar way in uh, chapter 2 of Thessalonians, calling him the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And some people say, well, this, this is still, still talking about Antiochus. Well, this doesn't fit Antiochus's history. So most people who, who, who go through and study this realize this is not Antiochus. This is the Antichrist. Verse 37 continues to, to describe him saying, He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. And I thought, what an interesting little phrase, the one beloved by women. What does that mean, the phrase? And it's a reference to the natural desire of Jewish women to bear the Messiah. Now listen to what, uh, and it's all out of Genesis 3.15, the seed that's promised to the woman in Genesis 3.15. John Wolford explains it like this, pious Jewish women in pre-Messianic times had one great desire. They wanted to be mothers with a view to him who is the promised seed of the woman. His birth was desired by these godly mothers of Israel. This king then hates God and hates his blessed son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we see his theology in verse 38. He says, he shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these. In other words, he's a, he's a God, he's a, 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 a man of military power. His God is is military power, military might. A God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver. He puts lots of money into this to build up his military with stones, precious stones and, and costly gifts. Verse 39, he shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. In other words, those who resist this Antichrist, they're going to pay the price. They're going to be removed in one way or another. But those who will go along with him, guess what he does? He gives them powerful political positions. Essentially, what he does, he bribes them to do what he, he wants to be done, to agree with him, and so he puts them in places of authority so they'll, they'll do his bidding, and he pays them off to carry out his evil, satanic plan. Now in verses 40 through 45, we see what is called the last battle. And I'll just read this to you because we don't have time to go through it all. But it says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. The king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into his countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites, all historical em enemies of Israel. Uh, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and of silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans, and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and north shall alarm him. And he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And that's not all. Last verse. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. What a great end to a terrible person. You know, there's, there's kind of weird, This what these verses sometimes make you think of as you're preparing. Here's what this made me think of. Humpty Dumpty set on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And, and you know, the Humpty Dumpty character of the nursery rhyme is sort of a, it's a common allusion, particularly to somebody who, who's in, in an insecure position. And uh, although this guy thinks he is, he's above everybody and he's untouchable, he is not out of reach of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Um, tell you one more thing, a couple other things here and we'll be done. 
Because as a kid, you know, I used to do something that probably should have got me a lot more trouble than it did. I used to tease my mom. This was like when I was like five or six years old. Still remember it. Tease, tease my mom about doing something that would get her, just to get a rise out of her, you know, even at that age. And sort of require, it should have required a response to my disobedience. And I would say in my bolder moments, uh, I'd say, oh, I can do what I want and I can run away and you can't catch me. <laughs> and I still remember what she would say. She would say, oh, I won't need to catch you. You'll come when I call you. <laughs> This is the power of our God toward evil. And uh, the brevity of that little verse 45, it sort of fits the suddenness of this Antichrist removal. Kind of like, I was the thought of one other thing, it's kind of like those old vaudeville acts where you have somebody who's, who's terrible and somebody with a long crook cane yanks the bad actor <laughs> off the stage. That's what God does, folks. What a terrible and agonizing time is coming. And um, maybe frightening too. But you know what? We could be fearless and hopeless, even in our day. But yes, God has a plan. And uh, what you have to wait to hear about next time, right? In our final message in Daniel. In the, re- in the meantime, I just want to leave you with this. I remind you of how things will progress. As things get worse and worse, don't be discouraged. And we serve a mighty God. As we await the Lord Jesus, 2 Timothy 3 says, All those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil people will pretend to be what they are not. They will become worse than ever as they fool others and are fooled themselves. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe.